Good morning and a happy Sabbath. Let's pray. Our Father and our God, we come to you again through Jesus Christ and in the Holy Spirit. We come in this house known by your name, a house where we come to meet you, to worship, and to hear your voice. We pray that you speak to us today, for we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, for those who don't know me, my name is Charles Nyakondo, one of the elders here, and I'm happy to welcome you for today, the Sabbath day. Um, I bring you greetings. For the last these three months, I was in Africa, Kenya, and I went to a number of camp meetings, a speaker and a reasoner, and they sent me with greetings. So do you receive them? Man, you are not happy to receive greetings. I'm so happy to hear that. Uh, time for the announcements. There are a number of them on the bulletin, so I ask you to check and read. And if some are a little vague, ask some questions, or they will be clarified. At this time, I will have Carmen give uh, an announcement. Good morning. So I'm up here kind of twofold um, because I'm giving information that I know Sharon wants to get out there, but it's also for Pathfinders and Adventurers. Um, it is now that time of year to start collecting food for the food, um, our Thanksgiving and Christmas food baskets that we give out every year. And this year, I think the count that we're giving out as of right now are we're planning on 27. Um, so out on the um, big round table out front in the foyer is a sign-up sheet. And those are the foods that we definitely need for the food baskets. Those, those are ones that we need in order to fill those baskets. But on top of that and along with that, Pathfinders and Adventures are doing their yearly food drive, which we take anything. So you have anything um, that you would like to bring that is a non-perishable food item, box, can, bag, doesn't matter. Um, all of those foods are going to be dropped. There's a box out front. It's a purple and white box, and it says food drive on it. And you can bring your foods and put them in there. And this will be going until the 11th of November. It's the Sabbath. I think it's the 11th. Um, we're going to be doing the food drive until then. So any Sabbath when you come, just put together your items. Look on the list and see what's definitely really needed for those food boxes so that we can get all of the necessary items. But like I said, we'll take extra items and put extra goodies in those food boxes if we have them. Thank you. Good morning. Happy Sabbath. Good to be here with you today. Only one person agreed with me. It is good to be here, though. Um, I do have an announcement for an upcoming event that we are holding in two weeks. And it's actually going to start on a Friday night. It's going to start at 6.30 on Friday night, the 20th. Um, and it is called, it is a group called Comfort for the Day. And if you're curious what Comfort for the Day is, it is grief education. And we have a couple who are coming in who have experienced grief. They will be talking about that, but they are also talking about how our church as a whole, the whole church family can be active in helping people who are going through the grieving process, how we can support one another and, and, and how we can effectively, oh, what's the word? I guess just support people in grief. And, and that's what we're going to be doing. It's going to start on Friday night, the 20th at 630. Then we'll come back on Saturday morning at 11 o'clock. And then we'll continue that afternoon. There will be a potluck that week, and then we're going to continue that afternoon. And then Sunday at 11.30, we will, we will reconvene, and we will finish up the, the event at that time. So I want to encourage all of you, 
each one of us knows somebody who has been in grief. I think even ourselves, each one of us has grieved at some point or another in our lives. And most of the time, grief is something that we don't know how to go through. We don't know how to experience it. And even if we do, we know somebody who does not know how to grieve. And we all need support with grief. Amen? And so I would encourage you to be here for that, to learn how you can play a role with the church in supporting people during their grieving process. Thank you. That's the 20th at 630. Make sure and be here. God bless you. I would have Renee also make an announcement. I'll put an emphasis. After Renee, Elder will come up and uh, give us on how to greet. Yeah, I just wanted to just remind everyone that next Sabbath is our Pioneer Sabbath. Um, we're going to take a look back at our early church history. If you want to dress up in like the 1800s, we'd love for you to do that. A lot of us um, are going to be dressing up just to commemorate um, what our uh, church history is all about. Um, and that's what I wanted to announce. Thank you. Happy Sabbath morning, y'all. Thank you for that. It's good to see each and every one of you. I have a, a little announcement. We've uh, met with the church board this week and uh, had a little discussion about, uh, about the worship service and that. And we want to make a little change and see if everybody would be on board with this. It's a little harder with everybody all spread out the way that we are. I'd love to see more of you down front. So maybe next week, huh? Anyway, uh, this would normally be the point in the service where we do meet and greet. And we, we don't want to lose that, but we want to make a little change. And, and uh, the reason for that is, what do we come to church for? To worship, to worship, to praise God and, and meet again with our Lord and Savior. Um, so that's the primary uh, cause, for I think, for everyone to be here. It certainly should be. Um, to see our brothers and sisters in Christ. Our church family is precious also. And we just want to change it up a little bit. If you would just remain in your seats today and look to your left and to your right and welcome the person on each side of you, just without getting up and moving around the sanctuary, that would be awesome. Let's switch that up right now and we can spend more time and closer focus on just worshiping the Lord. Um, so we're going to do that this week, next week, and let's see if we can make a habit of that and fill these front pews. Thank you. Now, can you hear me? Oh, now you can. All right, so now we, it's our children's story time. So we're going to ask the children to all come forward. Um, and while they're coming forward, what we're going to ask is we're trying to um, cut down on some of the confusion. Our kids are getting confused during um, the, when they take up the children's offering. So if you all are prepared and ready for them for after the story, we're going to be helping guide them up and down the aisles. And once they come past you, once those kids are down that aisle, they aren't turning around and coming back. We aren't going to have them running back and forth to try to keep them knowing where they need to be. So please have your offerings ready for them when they come your direction.
Good morning. So I'm just waiting for um, a picture to put on TV. Okay, can someone tell me what this unusual animal called? A platypus. Awesome, somebody knows what it is. Where can we find this animal? In the water. Lakes. Yes, they're in lakes and swamps. Under the sea, well, more like swamp. Um, what about what part of the world? What part in the planet can we find this animal? This is in set science class, so he knows where it is. In, um, in Eastern Australia. Yeah. So this is a platypus. Look at the picture. It has a bill like a duck, but they don't have feathers. Instead, they have fur like a cat. <laughs> Can you imagine? An animal with a, with a bill, but it has a fur like a cat. And look at their feet. It's webbed feet like a seagull. And the tail is flat like a beaver. And when they're upset, they can growl like a dog. What does that sound like? <coughs> yep. And... They c and they can also strike out with their poison tip spurs. A platypus give birth, does not give birth like any other furry animals. Instead, they lay eggs. Yes, it's unusual. It is safe to say that there is no animal on earth like platypus. In fact, when an explorer brought the first platypus to England, the people laughed at it. They said, I don't think this is even a real animal. I mean, it has a beak, it has a fur, and the tail, and, and the feet. It can't be real, right? Sometimes people laugh at people who don't look like us. We make fun of them. Um, because they look different and they look strange and this hurt their feelings and this also make God sad. So God says, God made all the people. He has made each person. He knows where we live. He knows what we will look like. So we, would, we should never make someone feel bad because they look different and act different like us. God enjoys a variety. Like Seth has black hair, and some of us wear eyeglasses to help us see. Some of us use wheelchair to help us walk. Um, these girls, these cousins, they have curly hair, beautiful hair. Zia is not here, but Seth always says Zia has yellow hair. And some people do not have hair at all. And it's okay, right? So why does why do you think God enjoys a variety? Because if everyone was the same, it'd be boring. Exactly. And we would know who was who. Yes, if we all look alike, I wouldn't be able to tell who is Shayla and who is Mia, right? It'll be strange. So please remember to be kind to everybody, even those who are different from us, even when they act and dress differently from us. Because every person is a part of God's wonderful crea creation and he loves each and every one of us. Everybody's different, yes. So can we remember to be kind to everyone this week and every day, not just this week? Okay.
Thanks so much. It is that time uh, again that we return our tithes and offerings. So we call upon each one and let's have a word of prayer. Our Father and our God, again, through Jesus Christ, we come to you and in the Holy Spirit. We bring what you have blessed us with, and we bring it so that it can serve in your work. May your blessings be upon your children and each one of us, for we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Is it on? Okay. Good morning, church family. As we sing our opening song, we're going to sing a bit as we gather together. If you could all stand, we'll sing, we'll gather together. some help. You may be seated. We're going to have our children of our church come up. I know there's not as many as we've had, but we would really appreciate it if our children can come up and sing with us this next song. It's called Jacob's Ladder, and we want to have our children help us because they're really good singers, and we also appreciate our leaders that are leading them in the divisions. Thank you. i 
children, you may be seated. Wasn't that great to have our children up here? I really enjoyed that. Thank you, children. The next song I like, it's a newer song, and it's called As the Deer. And if you don't know it, maybe you can learn it uh, as we sing it, and maybe for later on you'll know it better. For those of you that would like to come out front for our morning prayer, we would ask that if you feel comfortable in doing that, please join us. Those of you that don't feel comfortable coming down, just stay in your seats. You can kneel and do whatever you need to. I know I've had knee surgery, so I can't kneel, but you can go on the edge of your bench and fold your hands as we sing our prayer song. We invite you today into our sanctuary, into us, into this place, into our hearts. Please help us to be pure, to be holy, to be tried, to be true to you. We have so many things on our hearts. This world has been a battlefield, 
and we are under attack. There are so many prayer requests. There are people and names printed on the back of the bulletin of people who are struggling. An enemy has tried to attack us. We have a special request today for Jean McNitt, who is struggling. We've had people who have had surgery this week. We think of Michael Battle. We have people who are struggling emotionally and making decisions. Linda Mosier has asked us to pray for her today, and there are so many that we think of. And we want to submit to you, to submit to anything that you put in our lives, to give our lives to you with joy and with pleasure because we know that is, it is your will for us. And today we want to praise you and glorify you and be a blessing. And we pray everything in the name of Jesus because he is powerful and he's won the victory. And we praise you and we worship you. We worship you in the name of Jesus. Amen. We'd like to share a song that's, it's a very short song, but it has a really true meaning on it. And it call, it's called, God's Loves You.
happy to have the young people participate in our worship. All we have today is Saira. Good morning, happy Sabbath. My name is Shayla. Today we'll be reading Mark chapter 10, verse 52. Jesus said, go, you are healed because you believed at once the man who is able to see again. And he followed Jesus on the road. Didn't quite get that last amen in time. But we heard you. And we're amening with you. Good morning. Jumbo. To my Kenyan church family that are here today. Just want to make sure and greet you as well. And those that are watching on live stream from home or wherever you are, we welcome you today. We're happy to have you. We understand that you could worship just about anywhere in the world, and you've chosen to be with us today, so we thank you for that. It is truly a blessing, and when I say that, I'm not making it up. We look at our numbers each week of those watching our live stream, and there are certain countries that literally almost 500 people in that country are watching and worshiping with us today, and, and so just, you know, it's, it's a praise God moment that, to know that all around the world, we are worshiping the same God at the same time. I have an odd question for you, and you may think it a little bit silly as I explain why, but hopefully by the end of the message today it'll make sense. But have you ever wondered what it's like to be unable to see? Have you ever thought about that? A couple people. Um, I'm, one of those, I'm one of those weird people that I think about things like that. You know, my father was blind in one eye, my sister started wearing glasses at a very young age and was declared legally blind at a very young age. And so the way my mind works is I start seeing these things and, and people around me, I start wondering, well, I wonder what they have to go through. I wonder what it's like to be in that position. And so being a little bit of a worrier, you know, I started practicing just in case. And, and it, that usually entails me walking into a room and trying to find my place, you know, just to one place. That's all, that's all I really feel like I have to do. If I can find my way to one place, one specific spot, then I figure I can learn to do this and I can be okay with this. And, and so, you know, I get into the room and I start walking and I walk a certain amount of ways and I estimate in my head how many steps I have to be to get there and I stop. Overshot the pulpit just a little bit. But usually what it winds up is, is I've either overshot it by 8 to 10 feet or I've fallen short by 8 to 10 feet and I realize I'm in trouble if I ever lose my sight. I'll need, I'll need a dog or somebody to help me at least for the first few years. And I praise God that I have a wife that would be willing to do that. But have you ever wondered what it's like to be challenged without being able to see like you see now? can be pretty daunting. In the Bible, it speaks many times about people who face that challenge. And today we're going to look at one of those people. Um, how many of you heard of Bartimaeus? Pretty famous story, right? Pretty famous story. Actually, though, his name was only brought up one time. And, and, and to be honest, it's not really his name. It's not really his name. I'll explain that in that in the Jewish or the Hebrew culture, Bar means son of Timaeus. So really we have his father's name. We don't have his name. And it's mentioned in three of the Gospels. Um, the stories are recounted differently. Matthew recounts it as being two blind people at the same place. Luke mentions just one but doesn't give a name. And then Mark brings out Bartimaeus. And so we're going to look at Bartimaeus today. It starts in Mark chapter 10, verse 46. But Bartimaeus, there's something unique, and there must be something unique for Mark to take the time to not only give his name, but to give a detailed account of what happened 
with Bartimaeus. And, and Bartimaeus is truly an inspirational story as far as I'm concerned, and it has nothing to do with his lack of sight. But Mark sees this important, significant, and he starts out, let, let's actually just read it, Mark 10, starting in verse 46. It says, now they came to Jericho, talking about Jesus and his disciples. And he went out of Jericho with his disciples and a great multitude, blind Bartimaeus, the son of Timaeus, sat by the road begging. And when he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to cry out and say, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Then many warned him to be quiet, but he cried out all the more, son of David, have mercy on me. So Jesus stood still and commanded him to be called. Then they called the blind man, saying to him, Be of good cheer, rise, he is calling you. And throwing aside his garment, he rose and came to Jesus. So Jesus answered and said to him, What do you want me to do for you? The blind man said to him, Rabboni, that I may receive my sight. Then Jesus said to him, Go your way, your faith has made you well. And immediately he received his sight and followed Jesus on the road. Mark starts out and he gives us two very important details. The first detail being that Bartimaeus was blind. And, and that's pretty simple, it's pretty direct. He's blind, but it's very important to this story. And as we unwrap this story, we're going to see why it's important. Because being blind in Bartimaeus' day, it meant that he couldn't do most of the jobs in that culture, in that world. It, it was just impossible. See, when I was in sales, I remember I, I was covering for somebody, and I stopped by one of their accounts, and it was this little itty-bitty market. I mean, a little hole in the wall. You could probably fit the whole market in half of this platform up here. And, and you walked in, they had all kinds of, of groceries, and they had a little deli, and they cooked food, and they did all these things, and, and they were busy. It was one of those places that you look at and you would think that they didn't have much to offer, so nobody really was going to go there and eat. But it was amazing how many people were lined up outside the door and waiting. And, and I was brought in and I was introduced to the manager of this store. And as I spoke with him, I noticed he stayed at the cash register and he was looking at me as he was talking and ringing people up. And, and he was just, he had that finger. I mean, it was just going. And, and he's just talking to me like we're talking now as if, Everything was normal, and he was giving me his order and, and going into detail why he needed the order. I didn't care why he needed the order. I just needed to know what did he need me to bring in and sell to him. But he's, he's still going, and he's ringing up, and then he turns, and he says, that'll be so much dollars and change, and he would take the change and put it in the drawer, get the change, take it out, give it to the person, and continue talking with me. This guy was a talker, let me tell you. He would talk, he talked more than I do, and those of you who meet me in potluck know I can talk, right? This guy out-talked me. And I was literally getting antsy. I was like, I've got to go to the next stop. I can't just stay here all day. Well, finally, I, I, I got to go out, get the product that he needed, and I, I brought it in. And as I'm talking to the people, I'm like, man, he's really fast with that key punch, isn't he? They said, yeah, you'd never guess that he was blind, would you? You're right. I would not have guessed that. But he was working with a piece of technology that he could learn to use with his hand. It had all the amounts in Braille on his keypad. And so he had memorized where everything was. He knew all the prices of all the product. He knew right where each piece of change was. And, and so he worked it just amazingly. But in Bartimaeus' day, they didn't have any technology like that. And some of your main jobs were, what would you say, carpentry, what else? Farming. What's that? Farming. farming. Yes, farming. Uh, major in that culture, absolutely. Whether you were vineyard or whatever it is you're growing, that was, that was part of the main income. Um, sheep, shepherding, um, fishing, a fisherman's market. How many of those can you do blind? Easily. Now, I, I think Bill would probably tell me if you got a fish finder, you could go fishing and you'd be okay. And I would agree with him. I, there, there, when it comes to fishing, there's a way to pull it off, isn't there? You can go. But in those days, you couldn't. You see, you needed your eyesight. And especially in that culture, if you didn't have your eyesight, you were considered a little bit less than the rest of society because 
you can go out and earn a living. You become dependent on society, which meant you become a burden or a problem to the people. And it was one of those problems that... It's kind of like pulling up to the corner and, and you see the homeless people there and it's real easy just to look right over the tops of their heads. You know, you're, you're in your car and you just look right over the top. Nope, no traffic that way, no traffic this way, I'm going to go. And, and just move on and never even really see them there. In, in that era, in that society, it was the same way with the blind beggars. They could sit there right in front of you. They could cry out, Alms for the blind. They could cry out, please help. They could cry out, somebody's killing me, somebody save me. And <laughs> Did you hear that? Hear what? Eh, that's what I thought. And just carry on your day completely ignoring the fact that there was somebody in need at your feet. They weren't a menace to society, but they were not even second class, but third class, because they were a liability. And so without his ability to do anything else, that left him one occupation, and that was to be a beggar. Another similarity uh, to today is the beggars in that day figured out which roads had the most traffic to them. And they figured out if you're going to make a living as a beggar, you better be where the high traffic is because the more people that walk by, the higher the odds that somebody's going to give you something and you might actually be able to eat today. And, and so Bartimaeus, the Bible says that he's sitting outside the gate of Jericho. And this gate, Jesus was on, with his disciples on his way to Jerusalem. This was coming up into the Passover time. So there were a lot of people who were leaving through that gate on their way to Jerusalem to, to celebrate Passover. So that was like the ideal spot. And, and you know you see them. I, please don't tell me that you don't. I won't believe you. You know you see them when they're there at the same spot all the time. You know that's a good spot, right? Because that's where the most people are giving. They're, they're coming through. They're traveling. They're, the most options are to receive something from these people. Well, Bartimaeus was no different. This is the prime time to be sitting at the gate. And so he's sitting at the gate and he's waiting for people to walk by and as they walk by, he's crying out and he's asking for assistance for somebody to put some coins in his cup so, so that he would be able to eat. And so as Jesus was going, there's this large crowd of people and they're coming down the road and they're coming by Bartimaeus and you can almost sit there with Bartimaeus, can't you? You can almost sit there in the darkness, not able to see, but boy, you can hear people talking. And you hear the feet shuffling on the street. And you know this is a good-sized group. That means with a good-sized group, there's a pretty good chance somebody in that group's going to have mercy and they're going to give you something. So that cup starts raising up and you start getting your hopes up that I might get two meals today. And, and, and start lifting up that cup. But as he's listening, he realizes there's a voice in that crowd that stands out above everyone else's. It only takes a minute to figure out who that is. Because everyone else around, he can hear the hushed whispers, Jesus this, Jesus that. Did you hear what Jesus said? And, and he, he picks up pretty quickly that Jesus is in that crowd. And I would suggest to you, if he was holding up a cup, the cup goes down at that point. Because Bartimaeus, now remember we said he was blind, but I, I would argue that Bartimaeus, blind Bartimaeus, saw Jesus. What do I mean by that? He'd heard the stories. He knew who Jesus was. Stories had traveled all over the country. He knew that Jesus was one that went around healing people. He knew that all the rumors, he'd heard everything that Jesus had done. He'd heard the miracles. He'd heard the teachings. He'd heard the stories. He'd heard everything that was going on about Jesus. And he saw something in Jesus that most people did not see. And you know this from his words because what does it say? He began to cry out and say, Jesus, son of David. 
there was no mistake in his mind that this was the promised one. No mistake in his mind. He is not ashamed to say it either. Jesus, son of David, he didn't care what the scribes, what the Pharisees, what the the priests, he doesn't care what any of them have to say about Jesus. He's heard the stories, he knows the prophecies, and he knows this is Jesus, the son of God, and this is the one who has given him his opportunity. This is his one chance to change his job from being a blind beggar to anything else that is available out there. And he knows, he sees, this is one that will have mercy on me. This is one who will have compassion on me. And though everybody else is walking by and nobody's even bothering to to throw a penny down, Jesus is in that crowd. And as long as Jesus is in that crowd, I have hope that my life can change. And so he cries out, Jesus, son of David, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Shush. Isn't that our human nature? We're in the middle of listening to Jesus. And there's a large crowd here. There's a lot of distractions. We're walking down the road. It's hard to hear what he has to say. It's hard to focus on his message. Shush. Sit there and beg. Do your job, blind beggar. The Bible says that many warned him to be quiet. It wasn't wasn't just... Could you hold it down, please? They warned him to be quiet. But the Bible says he was not going to be stopped. This was his opportunity. He knew who was walking by, and nothing was going to stop him from making a connection with the Son of God. And so the Bible says that he cried out all the more, Jesus, Son of David, have mercy on me. And it says Jesus stood still and commanded him to be called. I find it interesting. All these people that he's teaching, and all the words of Jesus were intentional. There there was nothing, you know, he was in the middle of an important lesson, I am sure, that these people needed to learn but at the cry of someone who needed his help, someone who was on the down and out, someone who was in a bad position, crying out for help, Jesus stops in the middle of that instruction and he says, what does he say? He commanded him to be called, it says. Jesus was able to speak directly to Bartimaeus, wasn't he? He was in the same crowd that everybody else was in. In fact, Jesus, being the Son of God, probably knew his name. Probably knows that he's called blind Bartimaeus. But even if he didn't, he could have just said, stop, someone needs my help, how can I help you? He could have done that, couldn't he? But instead, he instructs the people that are standing around, the people that are following Jesus. He, said, he stops them. And he says, call him to me. You ever wonder why he might have done that? You ever ever stop and think, why did Jesus go to that much trouble to stop the people that are following him, that are learning from him, and to tell them, call him to me? I think there's an important lesson in here. I think there's an important lesson because, you know, as, as, as we look at this, Bartimaeus was a blind beggar. He was different than the rest of society. He had a job that not many people would look up to. He was considered insignificant. He he was somebody that you could easily pass by and ignore, and your conscience wouldn't burn inside you for very long until you'd forgotten him. Because there's going to be another beggar, and you're going to walk past them and another beggar, and you just continue on your way until it gets to where it's no problem. Bartimaeus was different. 
It was very easy for the people to tell him to shush. It was very easy for people to disregard somebody who is reaching out for salvation. It's very easy to ignore those people. It's very easy to take one look at those people and say, they don't look like I do. They don't act like I do. They don't dress like I do. They don't talk like I do. Whatever it is that makes them not like me. It's very easy to say, you know what? They're different. Shush. I'm following Jesus. I don't have time to be bothered by you. And I think Jesus was saying, oh, yes, you do. If you're going to follow me, you've got time to be bothered by the people who are reaching out to me. If you're going to be one of my disciples, you need to learn this, because if you can't do this, you're not my disciple. You may be walking behind me, but you're not following me. I think, one, he was teaching that lesson. Two, I think Jesus wants us to be part of his ministry. Jesus could easily spread the gospel message to the entire world just from the spoken voice and the entire world would hear it. He could do that. He's he's God. He's all-powerful. He could do that. But for some strange reason, he has chosen, he has elected us as people to be his partners in ministry. And I think because he wants us to be part. He wants us to help. You remember Lazarus. We talked about I I was at a memorial yesterday and I mentioned Lazarus and we talked about Lazarus a little bit, but there's something that I didn't mention about Lazarus because when Jesus raised Lazarus, he told the people to roll away the stone. Angel could have done that. He probably could have just spoke the words and that rolled right out of the way. Again, he's God, he's all powerful. But he asked the people to jump into ministry and be part of the ministry of raising the dead. And when Lazarus comes walking out, take the cloth off of him. Jesus is inviting you and me to be part of his ministry. He's inviting us to take his hand and walk with him. He'll teach us. He'll be patient. He'll, He'll walk us through this, and if we make mistakes, he'll pick us up, and he'll say, that's okay, learn from it. And he'll he'll start you right back over again, but he wants all of us to be part of his ministry on this earth. He wants all of us to take part in sharing the gospel message and sharing the truth that there is a God out there who loves you so much that he would send his son to die your death for you. He wants us to be part of that. So the people called Bartimaeus, and I love the line that they use here. They, They say, be of good cheer. Five seconds ago, shush. Be of good cheer. He's calling out to you. You should be happy. Blind beggar, he recognized you. That's a privilege. That won't happen every day. You know, they're still they're still working on this, I think. They're still working on that lesson. But but they call out to him. They they almost sound surprised that Jesus would take the, the time to stop in the first place, but then to 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 call a blind beggar to come and talk to him in the middle of his message. But what's more important here, I think, is how Bartimaeus responds to Jesus' call. I read it in my Bible. Some translations read it differently, but in my Bible it says that he threw aside his garment. Now, guys, I mentioned his occupation was a beggar, and have you ever noticed that most people dress for their occupation? If I were to say 30 years ago, what did doctors wear? Lab coat, white lab coat. What do they wear now? Scrubs. They wear their scrubs, right? They show up to work scrub. Nurses, you wear your scrubs. Caregivers, scrubs. What does the president wear? Suit. What does a police officer wear? Uniform. What does a baseball player wear? Uniform. What does a cook wear? An apron, right? So most people, you can figure out their occupation by looking at them. 
You know, what, what are they wearing? How are they dressed? You know, are, are they blue collar or are they white collar? You know, you can start figuring out. You may not be able to pin it down right away, but a blind beggar, you can pin down right away because they didn't have a lot of money. And, and their clothes would probably be dirty because they're sitting out on the street and everybody walking by and the dust settles down on them. And, and it's probably old, probably torn because there's, there's no word in here about his family being wealthy and he was able to wear nice clothes out there. In fact, if they were wealthy, he wouldn't have been sitting out there at all. So he's probably got old clothes that are starting to wear and tear, and, and, and he's dressed like a beggar. And it says he throws that off. He throws aside his garment. And it says he rose and came to Jesus. And where it says he rose and came to Jesus, in my version, if you were to look that up in a real version, it would say he leapt up. He didn't hesitate. He, it, it wasn't like me, you know. <laughs> you ever see me get up from being down on the ground? It, might take a minute, but not Bartimaeus. Bartimaeus is, is energized. Bartimaeus is motivated because he's cried out for mercy. He's calling out to Jesus Christ for mercy, and Jesus stops in the middle of everything that he's doing, pays attention to him, and says, call him to me. And in Bartimaeus' head, what he's saying is, he's going to change my life. Everything that I hoped for, the whole reason that I cried out in the first place, Jesus is going to answer my prayer. And so he throws off that garment because he says, I'm not going to be a blind beggar anymore and I ain't going to dress like it either. And he jumps to his feet. I'm ready for the change right now. There's no hesitation. He's ready to go. And the Bible doesn't say anybody led him to Jesus. It says, and came to Jesus. He went on his own. A blind man walks all the way to Jesus as if he knows right where he's at. Jesus wasn't even the one that called him. Jesus had them call him. And he gets up and goes directly to Jesus. And, and, and as you watch this unfold, you can almost see him standing there with his hands like this. Man, he's ready. He's ready. One foot to the other, just waiting for Jesus, whatever he's going to say. And Jesus says to him, what do you want me to do for you? The man doesn't even stop to say, isn't it obvious? There's no sarcasm, there's no nothing other than utter anticipation that Jesus is about to change his life. And he lays down his request. He says, Rabboni, and Rabboni is like rabbi except deeply, deeply respectful. Rabboni, that I may receive my sight. He knew exactly what he wanted. He knew his position in life. He knew what he'd been through. He'd experienced that forever. What can I do for you? He could have said anything. He could have asked for anything. I know people, I know people that put in prayer requests for, to God for 11 point some odd million dollars because they want to set up this thing and they want to do this and they want to do that. Just give me 11.4 million dollars. Yeah. No, just make it possible. Just open the door. That's all Bartimaeus is looking for. Just open the door to change my life. I'll walk through that door. But just give me a tool to work with. Give me my sight. Give me my sight, and I can live a normal life. And he knows, I said he was a blind man, and he saw Jesus for who he was. He knows who Jesus is. He knows that Jesus is the way maker. He knows he's the one that parts the sea. He knows he's the one that makes the dry ground. He knows he's the one that loosed the chains, that opened prison doors. He knows that Jesus is the way. And so he's very direct and says, open my door for me. Take my chains off and let me live. Let me live in this world. And Jesus looks at him and says, go your way. Your faith has made you well. And immediately he received his sight and followed Jesus on the road. I find it interesting that Jesus says, go your way. And Bartimaeus, Bartimaeus chose his way was Jesus' way. Wherever Jesus is going, that's where I'm going. Where, wherever he walks, that's where I'm going to walk. Jesus has opened up the door that my life can change. The Son of God has changed my life 100%. 
My life will never be the same again. And he gave me the option to go my way. And my choice is to follow him. My choice is to follow Jesus Christ. See, Bartimaeus saw Jesus. Better than any of those people with their sight, he saw Jesus for who he was. He knew what Jesus could do for him. And I don't know if he knew it beforehand or after the fact, but when Jesus healed him and restored his sight, he knew his way was the same as Jesus' way. He was going to follow him to the end. Now, I mentioned that there was something about Bartimaeus that Mark picked up on that was a little bit different than Luke or Matthew when they gave their accounts. And here's, here's what I think. This is, the, this is my theory. Please take it for a theory. This is my theory, is that Mark realized Jesus was on his way to the Passover celebration because he was getting ready to be the Passover lamb. Jesus was going to his death on the cross. He was in the middle of a mission to save the world. He was giving instructions and teachings to this crowd of people around him, and he stopped for one blind beggar to give him healing on the way and gave him the choice, go your way. Bartimaeus followed him. And it says he followed him the last week going into the cross. I would suggest that this blind beggar was an eyewitness of the gospel message. And I believe that's why Mark put his name there, Bartimaeus. He recognized him as what a tremendous witness this will be. That someone who was healed from their blindness, had their life completely changed, had the option to go wherever he wanted to go to do whatever he wanted to do. He chose to follow Jesus, and when he followed Jesus, he witnessed firsthand the crucifixion. And I would suggest he was probably one of those people who saw Jesus after he was raised. What a tremendous witness that would make. I was blind, but now I see. I would suggest he always saw Jesus for who he was. And when he was given the choice, he followed Jesus. Folks, we are all given a choice. My prayer is that you choose to follow Jesus. In everything you do, not just coming to church every Saturday morning, but in everything you do, when you see those people who are reaching out for Jesus, when you see people who are trying to get to Jesus Christ, and maybe they don't know how, maybe they can't physically do it, maybe whatever, whatever the reason, instead of just shush or ignoring and walking by, lend them a hand and lead them to the Son of God. That's following Jesus wherever he will go. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for Jesus Christ. We thank you for the example that he has given us, that there is no one that Jesus does not want to save. But instead, he wants every last person on this earth to be in his kingdom. And Father, we are, we are weak humans, we are frail, we have our biases, we, we just don't do well with this kind of thing. But with you in our lives, with you in our hearts, May you teach us how we can be like Bartimaeus, how we can be like those you instructed to call people, to lead people to you. And we pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. Our closing song is Have Thine Own Way, Lord, if we could all stand.
Father in heaven, we thank you for this time that you've spent with us today. And we thank you for the blessing of your spirit in our hearts. And we pray that as we leave here, whether it's to lunch, to home, or to visit, we pray that you would go with us and that you would bring us back next week in Jesus' name. Amen.